Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Fen Talks podcast. On today's episode, we're featuring Mark Lambert. He's one of our plaintiff's personal injury directors at the firm and someone you want to know. You know, Fenimore, it's unique to have a plaintiff's personal injury group within such a large um, business-oriented organization. So I'm curious if you could maybe explain a little bit more about how that came about within Fenimore. Yeah, I mean, it really is an interesting story. I've been at Fenimore Craig now going on 30 years. And when I came to Fenimore Craig, there wasn't a personal injury practice. Uh, When I came to the firm, they designated me as an environmental attorney. And in those days, that was, it was a great area. It was an area where there was a lot of opportunity and I had an interest. I had a science background. So um, I came in to do environmental work, but I you know, really realized in the first or second year that if I were helping people one-on-one and, and people who were in a position where um, the kind of the chips were stacked against them and they were going through a, a very difficult time in their life. I felt like that was my calling. I just felt more comfortable in that environment. Uh, I felt passionate about that. And so when I started practicing in the first year, year and a half, there were not emails yet. I know people can't even remember those days and, and some maybe weren't even born in those days. But but when I first started practicing, there were no emails. So it was hard to inform a large business firm that, I wanted to do personal injury work and help people. But once emails came out about a year and a half into the practice, I started sending out firm-wide emails to, to everyone and letting them know that uh, if they had a friend, a family member, a client, a client's family member who needed help in a personal matter, a car accident or having difficulty with insurance, that I'd like to help and that I do so for free just to try to develop the business. And I, it was one, one of the secretaries came to me and she had a son that was involved in an accident and asked if I could help. And and that was my first case. And I cut my teeth on that case. And it was a a car accident case. And then one case went to two and then two was four and four was like 16. And it just started growing more and more. And I I wasn't sure if the firm would allow this practice to, to flourish at a business firm, again, very unusual. If you look around the country and you look at national law firms, large national law firms like Fenimore Craig, they just don't have a plan of personal injury practice. And one of the reasons for that is there's oftentimes a conflict of interest, meaning that the people who I represent have claims against the clients that Fenimore represents. But we were able to navigate those waters and and the firm was super supportive and they and, and it was a way of showing our clients. It was a way of showing other, um, uh, our colleagues within the firm that, that we cared about them and we wanted to help. And, and, and we were a full service law firm, truly. And, and that's how it started. And it just grew and grew. And I, it, it's so interesting is even now after 30 years, I go around the firm and I know people's children. I know their spouses. I know their parents. I know their clients. I know their clients' families because I've represented them. And, and you know, these are now thousands of claims over, over the years. And I, I've always, you know, people say, well, why do you stay at Fenimore Craig? You're a personal injury lawyer. And I'm like, yeah, I'm proud of that. And I'm proud of being at this firm because we practice the right way. Um, I used to describe to people that we are the lawyer's lawyer. What does that mean? If you have a medical issue, at least if I did in my family, I'd want to know who the the doctor is going to send her family to. And I want to know the same thing. Who does the lawyer turn to when they are in trouble? And that's Fenimore Craig. We are that firm. We practice at that level. So it was always for me a privilege to be able to practice in the personal injury area, but to do it at Fenimore Craig, where I knew I would always practice the right way. I would always practice with the highest level of integrity and, and I felt good about myself. And, and, and honestly, 30 years later, I am more passionate about what I do than I was when I started. And I was really passionate in the beginning. And that gives me great comfort. And I've always told people when, when that no longer exists, when, when that stops, and I hope it never does, 
But when that does, then it'll be time for me to, to do something different. It's clear that you're really passionate about what you do. And I think that's what makes you such a wonderful attorney. And it's awesome that you found within the legal space, your niche, your, your passion. So I'm curious, you know, what led you to even get into the field? What was your inspiration for becoming a lawyer in the first place? Yeah. And and, and I'm sure this is not the first time that someone has discussed this. My father, um, we're, my family's from back East from, from New York and, and we moved out to Arizona when I was young, when I was six or seven years old. And my father was a practicing trial attorney back east in New York and in New Jersey. And when he came out here, um, he continued his practice. And he was a personal injury lawyer, the same area that I'm in. And, and I always saw my dad as a hero uh, in, in so many respects. He was an amazing and is still an amazing father, um, uh, an amazing spouse. And, and he was so passionate for the work that he did. He cared so much for his clients um, and, and fought so hard for them. It, it, it always impressed me. I, I guess I never realized what does it mean to be a personal injury lawyer, really? As a kid growing up, seeing my dad in the house every day, I knew he was a lawyer. I knew he helped people, but, but I didn't know the details. I didn't know what it meant day in and day out. Um, but I remember him having on his cards, and I actually remember him in the seventies, having a sign in the front of our house for a few years that said his name and it's a counselor at law. And that burned in my brain, this um, image of a lawyer who is someone who among other things is there trying to help you through a difficult time, trying to be your friend, your confidant during a difficult time, trying to help you get answers. Sometimes that's all you want. People think immediately money. And, 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 and so often when someone has been injured, the family members or the person who's been injured just wants to find out what happened because the system shuts down. And so you can't get information. And, and if, if I'm someone as a resource that can come in and help someone get answers and then they can make a decision, what are my options? Does it make sense to pursue this? Understand you always choose your battles in life. If I can be a part of that process, then to me, it feels right. And that's what I learned from my father. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I've always took to heart the term counselor at law. Now, let's go back to one of your earlier comments. You had mentioned the fact that, you know, emails weren't around when you first started practicing and technology has taken over a lot of businesses, but there still are some misconceptions that technology has not, you know, been integrated within the legal industry. However, I know your personal group has, you know, come a long way and you're actually very innovative in this space. Your team was recognized even by Apple for the use of the iPad. So would you mind just sharing a little bit more about how technology has transformed your practice? Absolutely. It, it, ultimately, one, one thing that, that I do as a personal injury lawyer is I tell someone's story. Um, I talk about what someone's been through and oftentimes how their life has been changed. And, and my goal is to accurately portray that and to do it in a way that someone who's um, watching feels what my client has been through, understands what my client has been through. That is what a jury ultimately will be asked to do in any case. If you try a case, your client will be presented to a jury and they will be asked to kind of stand in your client's shoes and understand what he or she went through and how their lives have been impacted. And what the, our group recognized early on was that technology is it's an incredible mechanism by which to, to, to communicate, uh, to communicate with the jury, to communicate with another fact finder or decision maker, uh, to communicate with a client. If you really go back to its genesis and how we started using technology, again, dating ourselves, it was one of the first, um, if not the first generation iPhone. And we put it in a red case and called it the red phone and was and we were giving them to our clients lending them during during the case so they would have effectively a bat phone to reach us it was it, it, so they whenever they wanted to call us and what we were trying to impart to people was different than other lawyers who do our work when you have an issue when you have a question 
you reach us. You, you speak to us directly. And we have these phones on the other side. So this is harkens back to the Cold War days when you had between the Kremlin, the, so, the former Soviet Union and, 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 and the United States and the White House, there was a, a red phone. So if, if, if one needed to communicate with the other, you had this phone dedicated to that. And that was kind of our, our thought process is our clients could always communicate with us. It would be a, 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 a way in which they could communicate. They could take pictures of their life because we're always trying to explain it to someone, how has this affected you really? How has this changed your life? How We're all different. We all do different things. The, the, the very same injury affects different people differently. And, and again, we're trying to explain to, to an audience how this has changed someone's life. So we started with the phone. And then we thought, well, once the iPad came out, wow, this is a phone on steroids. This is really cool. It, it, can we give this to clients? And we started, again, loaning them to clients so they could use it as a communication device. And then we, we said, you know, instead of sending them gobs and gobs of paper, that they have around the house that 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 is their file. Um, we're just going to download everything to their iPad, so they will have access to their entire file. And as the file grows, they will have it real time on their iPad. They can go through anything they want. It just this it became like this super communication device. And then we thought, well, geez, why would we limit it to clients? Why don't we, when we're trying to resolve a case, instead of sending your standard letter? that has an introduction and a body and a conclusion and says, we demand X. Let's do this by video. Let them see our clients because a jury, everyone is trying to decide what a jury would do with the case. Well, in order for uh, someone on the side to know what a jury would do with the case, they need to see our clients. They need to see how they speak, how they present, how they describe their injuries. Well, let's show them that. Um, how did the accident happen? Well, we now have um, computer generated imagery we can we can actually um um we can input data and reenact what happened in an accident to the most specific points distances um um lighting conditions so we we said well let's let's pack it with that let's put in there our experts and what they're going to say let's give the the fact finder all the information in in one place that is readily accessible so they can really evaluate our case. And we started giving, instead of one, like we in the old days, we'd send one letter. We started sending out 10 iPads. We wanted to make sure it went to every decision maker. And we put it in a, in a briefcase with Bose noise canceling headphones. And, and our goal was to make sure that everyone who was deciding the case really didn't, didn't, it wasn't coming from a lawyer and a lawyer's perspective of the case. It was, they were seeing they were seeing the story and they can make their own determinations. And, and that caught the attention of Apple. And we were the first law firm on their in business page that was highlighted. And, and I, I remember that uh, we went out, we went out to, to San Francisco um, and, and, and met with Apple executives, our team did. And then they called us a few days later and said, we want to send a film crew out to Phoenix and, and, and film you guys and how are you using our product? And it just, one thing led to another. And for us, again, what an amazing privilege. And, and it, and it kind of spoke to something important to us, which as a practice group, and I think as a firm, we believe that you've got to try new things. You, you, you can't just be satisfied with status quo. You just can't accept, well, we've always done it this way. And I'm sorry to tell you that lawyers do that at times, um, some more than others. And, and in, in my view, and I think in our firm's view, that's wrong. <laughs> and, and, and you have new technology that can assist in the presentation of your case. Why would we not use it? Why would we not explore the opportunity there, which we've done over and over and over again? And I'm not telling you everything worked. But, but to get to a place that works, you have to be willing to try new things. And, and you need to, to think of different ways to present information. And, and we've done that using all forms of technology. We've used Google Glass in a really interesting, and Google Glass isn't even around, but it's a, it's a virtual headset, right? It's, um, it, it, you, you wear it and, and, and it will show someone 
what you're experiencing. We had a gentleman who we were representing who was a double amputee. He lost his dominant arm and his dominant leg in a very serious accident. And amazing man and, and worked so hard um, to, to, to get back to, you know, activities of daily living. And, and to show a fact finder, someone who's deciding the case, what is it like for him to prepare a meal where he has to cut? And, and with Google Glass, it, it shows you first person what he's doing as he's cutting. You see his hands. You see him uh, and on a wheelchair that he has where he has one arm to manipulate that wheelchair. What is it like for him to operate a vehicle, to be able to, to, to get in his vehicle, be able to, to have his wheelchair picked up by a lift in the truck, that whole process. And, and by using that technology, it, 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 it showed jurors, it showed the person who would decide the case, what it was like to be him. Um, we had one scene where he was in a crowded place and it picks up everyone who um, stared at him. And, and it, it, even if he looked away, the, the Google glasses would actually pick up things in his peripheral vision. So as he would look away, more and more people would turn and look at him. And it's one thing to say those words. It's another to visually show people what that's like, because we don't know. Most of us will never know um, what that feels like. And, and my job as an advocate for my client is so people know what does it really feel like? I know he lost an arm. I know he lost a leg, but, but what does that really mean? What does his life look like? So we've, we've gravitated toward um, technology in part for, for that reason. Um, we also, or I certainly believe that it, you, you wanna make things more compelling for everyone. And, and, you know, like every profession, right? Lawyers are people too, and they get bored and they can do the same thing over and over and over and over again. So if you send them just another demand letter telling them why your client should be paid for this accident, my experience has taught me that generally people will go to the conclusion and just read what you want and they won't get the story. And, and to me, uh, I'm not doing my job if that happens. And, and through technology and innovation, I feel like we can be more effective at what we do. It's more interesting. Um, there's so many benefits that flow from it. And, and I guess in closing on the technology side, I remember giving um, presentations and seminars about technology when emails were just being introduced. And give you some insight into to being a lawyer. There were a lot of lawyers in the audience who said, and it's, it's, it, you can't imagine anyone saying it now, but they actually said, emails are going to go away. They're not going to stick around. They're just not the way we're going to communicate. Um, and, and, you know, look at where we are now and look at where we are with other forms of communication, whether it's texting or social media. And, and if any one of us thinks that's going to change, I, I would suggest to you politely that, that that's wrong because it's not going to change. It's going to continue to move in that direction more and more. This is a snowball, snowball going downhill and it's getting bigger and bigger and that's not going to change. So part of the thought process was, well, this is awesome and it helps us and helps our clients and it's interesting. It's also not going anywhere. And, and, and so kind of better to embrace it and become an early adopter than someone who sits on the sidelines. And so we've always been that group. And, and again, but it's for people always to know, it doesn't mean it always works and it doesn't mean it always has to, but you have to be willing to take that risk. Uh, and, and, and so that's, that's the technology side, Lindsay. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing even that story about your client. I think that gives us some more perspective on the important work that you're doing on behalf of your clients. Um, you had mentioned that you know, you're know you out of Phoenix, Arizona, but I think it'd be helpful if you could clarify, do you only help or represent individuals from the Phoenix market or? So no, so we, we, we 
um, help people um, around the country uh, who've been involved in all varieties of accidents. Um, we've I, I've had personal experience in so many states. One, I'm licensed in Illinois. I'm licensed in Colorado. I'm licensed in New York. Um, but beyond that, we've handled cases in New Mexico and California and in countless states. And and so what we do is when someone is involved in a serious accident, we help them. As I told you before, we help them get answers. Um, we help them get compensated fairly. And then we help them, importantly, get closure so they can move on with their life, which is really important. So that's what we do um, in all different types of accident type cases. So trucking accidents, um, we've handled a lot of over the years, which tends to be around the country. And, and when, when you're involved in a, a vehicle accident with a tractor trailer, it, it, the tractor trailers carry so much um, tonnage that it normally involves really serious injuries or, or worse. Um, and so we see a lot of trucking cases. We've seen aircraft cases where aircraft go down um, where we've helped people. Um, we've seen cases where insurance companies are not stepping to the plate um, and doing the right thing um, and covering a loss where we've helped people. We've helped people who have been involved in incidents at restaurants and, 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 and clubs where they've been injured. Um, we've, been, we've helped people who've been injured by products of all sorts um, that um, caused someone to be injured and, and the product wasn't made the right way. It was defective. And we've helped people through that. So that is around the country. And we've actually had cases dealing with issues in different um, countries other than the United States, believe it or not. They're few and far between, but um, I have a case that we went to a mediation to try to get resolved, and and it was in um, it, it was in Bermuda, and and people always ask me, oh, you got a rough job, you went to Bermuda for a mediation, and I'm like, we had a a three day seventy two hour mediation, we did it in a, a basement of a hotel with no windows. Um, for three days and to, to try to resolve a case. And, and so the practice is, is, has taken us around the country and at times even internationally. Um, but what's important for people to understand is just because an accident happens in a different location doesn't mean that you need a lawyer in that location. And, and if someone lives here particularly, um, it's much more convenient for them to interact with us and then if we do need to hire a partner law firm in that other jurisdiction, for whatever reason, we can do that, but we become the point of contact. So I know your passion goes above and beyond just helping individuals. You've helped to write and sponsor legislation. Would you mind expanding on some of that work that you do? Yeah, sure. Um, that's something that's super meaningful to me. I always think in, in terms of what I do, if I were you know speaking with my 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 two boys, I have two teenage boys, can I feel proud about what I do? And and do I believe when all is said and done that in, in, in my practice I've I've made a difference in, 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 a, in a positive way? And and I I answer that question yes. And one of the things that that give me um, a lot of fulfillment, a lot of satisfaction is when we've had the opportunity to help change the law, where the law wasn't good, where the law wasn't sufficient, and and we change the law in a way where I'll never know when another accident didn't happen or was averted when a life was saved, but I know it happens. I'll give you some examples. Um, we represented a family who lost their daughter, their young daughter um, in a tragic school bus accident where the school bus um, children were getting off the school bus and it was in a private neighborhood. So the school bus operator didn't put out that stop arm that you see extended by by buses and didn't put on the flashing lights because arguably it wasn't required because it was a private neighborhood. 
And as a little girl was crossing the street, um, she, she was run over and actually wound up. Her mom was there to, to get her. Her mom came running to her and she tragically passed in her mother's arms. Um, for that family, what mattered most was that another family not go through this ever. So we worked in, with Fenimore Craig's legislative practice area. And that's one of the luxuries of being at a firm like Fenimore Craig. We have experts in so many different fields. And, and we worked with the legislative group and were able to get uh, something called Elizabeth's Law passed, which was legislation that required school buses to always, always extend the stop arm and, and, and put on the flashing lights when they're dropping off kids or picking up kids, regardless of whether it's in a private neighborhood or not. So can I tell you that I know of an instance where an accident didn't happen because that stop arm went out and those lights went on and saved a child? I can't because I wouldn't know, I have no way of knowing that. But do I know that's happened? I do. And does that make me feel like, okay, that matters. That, that, that matters. And, 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 and yeah, I, we've done things like that throughout the practice. And, and to me, uh, it, it, it feels like you're doing right. Sometimes it's right is right. And you know it. And, 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 and it feels good to be a proponent of that. And, and so, yeah, that, that's been a part of our practice group for a lot of years. So Mark, for those listening, and let's say they've gone through one of these experiences recently and they're in need of finding somebody to help them through that process, can you explain what it would look like to get in contact with you and what that process is? Sure. I, I first um, first want people to know the best way I can help someone with an accident is to help them not get in the accident. <laughs> and 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 for people to be thoughtful of kind of what could happen and how we can be prepared better for that. If it's through insurance or making sure that folks know when they're driving, don't be using your cell phone. Don't be texting, um, impaired driving right now. We've got marijuana that was, that was legalized in, in, in Arizona. Um, just know you don't want to get behind the wheel if you're impaired. And, and those are things that can save lives. So, so part of my messaging is just for folks to know, that um, these are ways to avoid an accident. So you don't have to ever call me because I don't, uh, no disrespect, I don't want you to have to call me because when you're calling me, that means something less than good happened. Um, and, and so I'd rather you not. When you are considering calling a personal injury lawyer, I strongly recommend that you follow the recommendations of family and friends or you have some connection to someone. I think that's really important because that they're going to endorse that person and you want that. I would not personally just go and, 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 you know, it, it, there are a lot of effective marketing law firms out there and I'm not in any way disrespecting them, but I, for me, and if you're asking my opinion, I would recommend finding a lawyer who comes highly recommended to you um, and, and understanding that with all personal injury lawyers, the way a personal injury lawyer charges is we don't charge by the hour. We charge only if we get a certain positive result for you money. So it, it doesn't cost you money to call someone and speak with someone. And a lot of people don't understand that they're, they're fearful because they're like, well, how much is this going to cost me? And it doesn't cost any money at all. When you call a lawyer and what I recommend is calling lawyers, get a second opinion. Get a third opinion and, and, and see who sounds right to you, who feels right to you, who feels, you know, connected. You ask the tough questions. Are you going to handle my case, Mark? Are you the one or is there going to be some person in your office who's going to handle it? Well, Mark, I'm worried. How are you going to be give my case the attention it deserves? How many cases do you handle? There are lawyers that handle hundreds of cases, not I. And 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 I want to know that. So think about, write down your questions before you speak to these lawyers and you should interview them. This is not them interviewing you. This is you finding the right person. It's like a medical procedure. Again, if you're going to a doctor, 
you want to find the right doctor. If, if you need, you know, God forbid, some, some life-saving surgery, do you want to do your due diligence on that physician? Of course. Same thing with a lawyer. So that's finding a lawyer and speaking with different lawyers and, and, and following, you know, hiring someone who feels right to you. And, and it, it's nice if you have someone who's been referred to you and someone who says, yeah, I, I worked with that lawyer. That lawyer was, was wonderful. And that team was wonderful. And then obviously, once you, you narrow the names down, you go look online. I think that that is viable. And to look at reviews, I mean, again, you have to kind of balance things. Um, and, and when you're looking online, you have to be um, careful. And, and, and make sure that things are as good as it would seem based upon online reviews. But you want to read those reviews. You want to look at how many reviews are there. How specific are those reviews? Again, the more information you can amass, it's an important decision. It really, really is an important decision. So you want to find the right person. Um, and and that, that, that's a process. And you shouldn't sh- you give it short change. So for those individuals that are looking to further connect with you, what is the best way to contact you? Any way to contact me is you, you, any way, whether it's my Fenimore Craig email address, I have, I give out my, my cell phone so you can text me. Um, I give out my home number. We, that's the way the world, you know, operates now. And, and, and um, you want to make yourself as accessible as possible at all times accidents don't happen during these hours they happen at all times on all days in fact you know talk about this a lot in the media is that accidents tend to congregate more around holidays and and so you have new year's we have july 4th you have your kids come home for the summer unfortunately that's where we see more kind of mishaps and um and our doors are always open we work um, I know everyone says this, but it's true for us. We're 24 um, seven. And if, if we're helping you on a case, then, then, then that person would be, would be me. Um, and, and I take, I don't take a lot of cases. Uh, I, I take 10 to 15 cases um, where I work on alone um, just with uh, my assistant, Jenny. And um and that allows us to um, to be available at all points in time. And the call we don't want to get from a client is the call from a client asking for the status. I don't want that call. I don't want someone needing to call me to find out what's going on. So we work real hard and we're not perfect. I don't sit here and say we're perfect, but we work very hard to be proactive and to communicate with our clients so they never have to call us to ask us what's going on. We communicate with them by phone, by email, by text. Obviously, we want to be careful um, just with electronics. You don't want people seeing your emails. These are private, confidential communications. So we just want people to be careful. But yeah, it, we take not a lot of cases, but then we develop a really close connection with our clients. Um, and I feel like kind of as we get toward the end of this conversation, what's, what's nice about that and again, where I've been very fortunate is those relationships tend to last much longer than the case. And you develop friends and you follow your clients and their families through their life milestones, whether it's having kids or you know graduating from college, um, all kinds of things. And I've learned so many things from my clients um, about being a better human being, about being a better husband about being a better father, by being a better kind of global citizen. Um, very, very, very fortunate to do what I do. Um, and, and, and while I deal with tragic circumstances, I feel like to help someone during those times, there is a beauty in that. Um, when someone needs someone most, you're there to help and, and, and your heart's in it. You do it for the right reasons. 
and and um, that keeps me going, um, and I suspect it always will. So, Mark, as we look to wrap up today's conversation, is there anything else that you'd like to leave our audience with? No, other than just to say how lucky I am to to practice at Fenimore Craig and and to be a part of the dynamic team that it is. You know, so often you hear that it's the law firm that's been around the longest. <laughs> And, 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 and that's true. And that's, and that, and that's, you know, this speaks to our staying power and our success. But I think I've always likened this to, you know, like the newest thinking old firm or, you know, or something of that nature is because if you look at what we're doing, we are leaders and we are cutting edge and we are out there in the front, um, not only of technology, of innovative ways of doing things that make me feel like I love it. And I know if my client has an issue where they need another lawyer to address an issue, I have my partners and, and, and colleagues at the firm that are going to help. Um, and, and I know they're going to practice the right way. There are way too many lawyer jokes out there and I get it. I understand. Um, but sometimes it does a disservice because there are a lot of legal professionals, um, who work really hard, who care deeply for what they do um, and, and practice with the highest, you know, ethics and scruples. And, and one of the reasons that, you know, married me to Fenimore Craig is that's the way the firm operates. And, and to me, that makes me proud. Mark, well, thanks so much for taking the time to share some of those really touching stories about some of the clients that you've worked with, as well as a behind the scenes look of what it's like to work with your personal um, injury group. So Mark, thanks again for joining us for this episode. Thanks for giving me an opportunity, Lindsay. Thank you. Take care.